Hi everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to be chatting about the steering in the Ultima. I'm going to show you how we get that installed. I'm also going to run over universal joints, what they are, uh, why it's important to have them aligned so that you get a constant velocity and a constant force in and out of that arrangement. Uh, if you own a four-wheel drive, that'll also maybe give you an idea about why you will be destroying CV joints if you decide to go a 10-inch lift and not make appropriate changes or upgrades. Uh, we'll also be running over the Raptor controller giveaway. I've got someone in mind for that who I think is going to put that to exceptionally good use, uh, which which is good to good to see. And apart from that, uh, it's only going to be a pretty short one this week because I convinced my dad to buy a Jaguar and it's 1,200 k's away and we're going to hop on a plane and fly halfway across the country, uh, collect something from the mid-60s and proceed to drive it back home. So uh, that'll probably be the end of the end of the video. Uh, we might even drop into a pretty special place in Queensland. They do some of the best GT40 replicas and Cobra replicas on the planet. Uh, so we might just stick our heads in there and have a bit of a look, which might be of interest to, to people who are interested in these types of cars and, and maybe uh, are interested in getting one themselves. Anyway, we'll get into it. Uh, we won't waste too much time. Uh, if there is anything that you guys hate there or, or you love, there will be a couple of different things in this video. So by all means, mention them to me and we'll either exclude them or keep them coming. Okay, so here's our steering arrangement here. We've got where the wheel bolts up via its crush zone and Raptor controller. And that will be obviously our input to this steering shaft. Then we've got a universal joint that allows for two, two planes of misalignment. It then passes through the firewall and then, and then attaches to the steering rack. Now the important thing to conceptualize here is like with any sort of lever or anything like that is that you're generally trading off uh, speed and force. So what we need to be conscious of with a universal joint is if we have an input shaft, then we have a universal joint, then we have a, an intermediate shaft, another universal joint, and then an output shaft. If this angle here and this angle here are identical, they will cancel out the variation in rotational speed. Whereas if we just had a single row, a single input shaft and then one universal joint, what you will find is that you'll have an input speed here and then this output speed will actually vary uh, as, as you move through the rotation. And also the force on this input will vary, will vary as well. So what we need to do with this steering arrangement is try and get this angle and this angle as close as possible as we can. There's a spider on the lens there, sorry about that. Uh, but that's just something that I think is probably best illustrated by a short video that I'll attach uh, in the description. If you have a look at it, it actually just has a, I guess, a, a constant velocity electric motor. And you'll see that the intermediate shaft will uh, vary in speed. And also, you'll see the output shaft will change uh, in speed and load if if the, the angles aren't identical. So that's just something to be, be aware of. We're going to get as close as we possibly can uh, with this steering arrangement, being aware that you do have to work within the confines of the of the cabin. It's just something that uh, I like to look at. Obviously with that load varying with also the leverage ratio, I guess, or velocity varying, um, that's why if you have huge degrees of misalignment, this intermediate shaft will always go through uh, a, a cyclic speeding up and slowing down as you go through rotation. And that's why with CV joints, particularly if you have a huge angle, you'll see that they blow apart uh, on, on most sort of cars. And that's why you'll see massive full drives that'll be throwing CVs at, uh, at sort of the drop of a hat or as soon as they're shock loaded. But that's how we need to attack this one. Just try and get the angle of the steering rack here. Uh, as close as possible to the angle that we have here uh, from horizontal. And then what we'll do to check that is we're gonna use the angle gauge and just the spirit level, just to try and get those as close as possible uh, and making sure that we can still get that steering shaft through the hole in the firewall uh, as in its most reasonable way, I guess. We're just gonna connect the lower joint to the rack. Uh, I've got a little bit of lubrication on there, which is good already. that one there we've got the rack locked in place so we know it's on center and now it's just a matter of lining everything else up to get it in place there feed the steering shaft through here and then join it at the top
Right, so here's a, one of the steering shafts, and what you need to do is you need to remove the anodizing off the end of it. So I've just got a brass uh, brush here in a drill, and I'm just running it and just cleaning up the ends. Now, I probably underappreciated it uh, when I looked at the instructions because what it then says is to just work this shaft in and out uh, of the of the UJ uh, just to get it to fit neatly. And to start with, I just didn't think it was going to go in. And you can't hit this with a hammer because I'd suggest that the bushing in here is either plastic or, or some sort of nylon or something like that and it would destroy that. So you have to be very careful. But uh, look, I have done this for probably the period of about... 20 minutes on each joint so you're trying to I guess turn a virgin into a seasoned prostitute but it uh, it does eventually get there so anyone who's doing this just be aware that you're gonna have to spend a lot more time than you ever expected just just working that uh, that spline in and out of that that universal joint there so um, look that's it I, I've done this for all the joints and it's literally just a, a a whole heap of time just doing this and slowly but surely it'll start to work itself into the final position uh, you obviously once it's in the car it's very hard to get enough force in there to force this joint in uh, and they're, they're for, for good reason I'd suggest that they're going to be quite tight because you don't want any any slop in the steering Here we've got the steering shaft and again we need to remove the anodizing here just to ensure that we have the right clearance in here. At the moment this is very tight and it's actually the difference between it uh, rotating smoothly in here is not just lubrication but we actually just need to remove that, that protective coating. Uh, so what I've done is I've got this pushed in here to position as a 30mm extension and then I've just marked where the bushings are so I can remove only the anodizing where it's going to be within that bushing and then I just need to carefully tap this out again. And we can see the markings there. Get this out. And we'll just remove that anodizing there and there. Now to remove that anodizing, we've got a suitably sized piece of emery cloth, you know, sandpaper, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and we're just going to wrap it around and rotate the steering shaft just to remove remove that little bit of, I guess, yellow coating, is that what we call it? Gold colored coating. It's actually coming off a lot easier than I anticipated. You can see there, it's quite a bit shinier. Uh, what we might actually do is get that down to a sort of a, even touch it with some 1200 grit or something like that just to, uh, I guess, make it as smooth as possible, which will mean that the nylon bearing slips a little bit nicer and it also uh, lasts a bit longer, it doesn't wear out. So that's that one there. Do the same up here for the upper one. I mean, it sort of doesn't matter too much in the sense that I don't think the anodizing provides much uh, in the way of protection where this is. It's obviously within the cabin and not going to be exposed to, to anything. So, uh, so just that's, that's pretty much it. Right, so steering shaft needs to go in. Uh, as always, a little bit of just light machine oil or whatever is going to help proceedings. You can already feel that it just seems to move through that that uh, little bush there a little bit a little bit more smoothly than it did previously. So uh, even though it seems like a fairly trivial thing to be doing, it uh, it actually has had quite a quite an important effect. Uh, I'm not the only person who's been building an Ultima who's thought, oh, geez, this seems a bit a bit uh, tight as it goes in here and doesn't want to rotate. But that's that's obviously exactly why. That's sort of the tolerance that you're looking at. Keep in mind that if I can rotate this like this, once you get a wheel on the board and you've got a lot more sort of torque, you can see the resistance here is going to be pretty uh, minuscule in relativity. There we are. Perfect. All right, now we've got the rest of this squared away and we've got the, the steering rack locked in place and, and tightened using a torque wrench so you don't crush the rack and destroy a very expensive piece. What we're going to do is we're going to use a set of calipers and we just measure between the rack itself and the mounting point. And the way that we're going to do that is we're going to measure it at this end, measure it at the other end, ensure that the rack is centered and then we want to lock the rack in place because then we're going to ensure no movement and it's going to be important for when we set the center of the steering wheel because we want to align that upright 
that we don't uh, eventually hop in the car and we've got the steering wheel on the piss and we're trying to drive straight down the road. It's best off to be as careful as you can with this stuff. Uh, what they recommend in the manual here is to fabricate a bit of angle that's 61 mil long. I've actually measured this both sides and it came down to 59 point four two or something like that was the the middle ground for both sides and i just 3d printed up a couple of locking tabs here which happen to fit uh sort of fairly perfectly uh between here and should do the job for now and into the future so look that was my process obviously you could just uh, knock some up but it took me two seconds at work to print this um clearly i can't put that in with one hand but uh that's that's the process anyway i've got the same same thing on the other side uh it was an accurate way of doing it, obviously, on the 3D printer, but that should get us out of out of trouble for the moment. And we'll also leave them in place when we set the suspension geometry, because obviously you do want the rack centered when you're doing that. So we've got the wheel in position there. Uh, it's just held in place using a couple of clamps there for the moment uh, so that we can sort of line up the holes there for the crush zone and then drill them and position it. I've just used a level to get that wheel to ensure that it's uh, completely level and then also I will physically sit in there because even though it might be level on paper, uh, the way that it feels in the car is pretty important to, to, to make sure it's correct. You can see the crush zone there, obviously it's designed so those angled pieces of metal, in the event that you do use your uh, face as a, as a sledgehammer into the wheel there, they will obviously bend out a little bit before you hit uh, the solid mounting of the steering and, and give yourself brain damage. So that's how that works. Uh, it, it is a design requirement for most countries now and that's, that's how they get around it. So it's important just to make sure that we get everything level there before we drill all of it. Uh, you wouldn't want to find that you're honestly driving down the road for the first time and, and the steering wheel's on the piss. It'll do your head in forever. So that's what we're doing there. Then once we get this in place, we can mount up the Raptor controller, make sure that it talks to its uh, to its uh, counterpart there and switches all the relays and, and move on with life. So pretty good, pretty excited to see this in the car now. And here's the wheel in its final position there. There is a shroud that goes over that crush uh, zone there, but you can see the Summit Technologies Raptor controller is looking pretty awesome. Uh, obviously, all of the controls here for, for a road-type car, and I've got a personalized center cap that I did there. Uh, these obviously can be programmed to any number of functions. I mean, the road-based function is obviously going to suit this particular car, but what you can do is you can use this for switching maps on ECUs, uh, you know, if you had uh, meth injection or uh, nitrous or any any number of different things you could control in here, rain lights, push to pass, it's virtually endless options. These are IP rated as well, so if you have an open cockpit car, you, you're fine just to mount these up and it's made out of a really solid uh, material that, that means that it's quite robust. These really are like top spec race car stuff. You'd see this in, in you know, professional GT cars and I, I can't rate them highly enough. Lee from Summit Technologies is an absolute legend in that sense. Uh, and I really do appreciate him sorting me out for this. Obviously, this center cap here uh, just pops off. That's where the the uh, I guess tra the uh, transceiver in this case and the um, and the battery just mounts. Uh, apparently, the latest version of these does have a, a battery indication warning or something like that if these are starting to go flat. Of course, it's just a button battery, so you could just keep a spare one there. Uh, this is magnetic, whereas the older ones uh, were just a twist a twist to lock one, which is quite nice. The way that these are wired is virtually you just have this, which is a completely wireless control. Uh, you can use it with the detachable steering wheel of course and just just pop it off as you need and what it does is it communicates with depending on where it is in your car uh, which obviously you mount it wherever you like a controls box now this is the one for this one obviously the factory harness for Ultima is already pre-wired for this sort of stuff that'll you know make everything talk to each other but in your car if you're installing it, what you would do is you would uh, just follow the wiring diagram and all this basically is is that it's uh a series of, of wires that you use to either switch external relays if they're over 10 amp or you can actually run 10 amps through uh, most of these circuits if not all of them uh, to switch things uh, as you please and there's obviously an option there for controlling this you can have momentary latching uh, or, or uh, I think it'll actually do flashing and it'll also just uh, do your standard uh, on and hold and then off uh, type function. So really good in that sense, uh, and that's quite good. Here's a loom that comes with it normally. Obviously, as I say, mine came with the factory loom already wired in, but all you need to do is just connect these up. It's simple. If you are switching a relay, obviously what you have in a relay setup is you, you will have a high current input and then a, you know, it'll go to the device and then you'll just have a switch line, which is what this would feed if it's, if it's over that 10 amp. So really great stuff. Uh, who I'm gonna give this to? Well, it's uh, 10 to 4 and we're about to go to Sydney. We drop the Land Rover off to get it turbocharged. It's got its EGT gauge and uh, boost gauge and secondary water temp gauge. 
then we're going to fly to Queensland to pick up this Jag. So, uh, the stupid things to do, but this will be a bit of fun, I think. Now, this might be of interest to a few people who maybe travel and do some things with their cars or, or even just want a toolkit for, uh, I guess, some extended journeys away from home uh, if you don't have uh, roadside assistance and that sort of stuff. I've found that these are the things over the years that have kind of been able to get me out of jail if I, you know, hold a radiator, break an exhaust hanger, uh, screw some suspension, that sort of thing. Uh, so, obviously, to start with, um, Multimeter is pretty pretty uh, precious if you need to diagnose any electrical faults. Uh, you should always have just you know a few fuses in your in your kit as well, uh, just so you can uh, replace ones that blow. The other thing you can do is you can always pinch one fuse to replace one that's uh, more important. Obviously, you can't get away with something that's uh, critical like a fuel pump, but you can do away with things like indicators if you need to. In the worst case, otherwise we've got some uh, the obligatory zip ties, which are pretty pretty invaluable. Uh, I also take some stainless steel zip ties. I take a variety of different hose clamps because they can, uh, even in the worst case, I had a radiator hose blow, blow and I managed to tape it. And then I also used some hose clamps around it just to reinforce it and that, that got me out of trouble. In fact, I ran uh, four sessions of Bathurst on an MX-5 doing that. Uh, a ratchet strap is always useful. Um, I just find that they're, they're invaluable at times. Uh, one or two gloves that are decent just in case you need to deal with something hot. Uh, yes, there is some JB weld. It, it can be pretty useful at times. Some silver tape, which is uh, reinforced tape that kind of just really sticks to itself. It, this stuff is what I typically purchase from uh, heating and ventilation and air conditioning joints. It, it, it tends to be the best stuff. Uh, a couple of nuts and bolts, a clip lead, a center punch, a set of files because the, the Jag, of course, is still going to be running points. It's not going to be running electronic ignition. So if you need to deal with that, a set of just fine files is, is really important there. A G clamp, a set, full set of spanners. Uh, in this case, they're going to be Imperial, but uh, the Jag probably is something like BSP or, or Whitworth or something retarded like that, so that's going to be interesting. Uh, a few different screwdrivers, uh, a couple of flat blades, a couple of uh, Phillips heads, and we've got needle nose pliers, bull nose pliers, set of side cutters, uh, the invaluable shifting spanner, which can also be used as a hammer, uh, a set of hex keys, um, a couple of octopus straps or whatever you want to call them, and I think that's just about it. Uh, look, that, that enables me pretty much to be able to get get my way out of most trouble. I mean, if you completely destroy a gearbox and you can't, you know, you just can't drive anywhere or you break, or break a drive shaft with a non-LSD diff, you, you're kind of screwed. There's not much you could do there. Uh, but, you know, anything that's less major than that, these things will probably get you home. So, look, uh, I just stick it in a small safety case here. I'm going to have to fly, so we need to do this as check-in, and I don't want to have $5,000 worth of tools sitting in there either. So it is a bit of a balancing act, but that's what I do, and we're going to see uh, whether we can get home. I mean, surely uh, getting a reliable mark like Jaguar from the 1960s and driving, you know, 1,300 kilometres cold without even seeing the car is going to, going to pan out well for everyone. But we'll see what happens. Here's the other thing that I took as part of my toolkit, which I thought was pretty good. I actually found this uh, the day before I left. It's a, a socket set, but it has uh, double-ended sockets so that you have metric on one side and then imperial on the other. And it obviously is quite good because it goes from everywhere up to about 24 mil from say a six mil socket or something. I haven't actually used it. Thankfully the car got home okay, uh, but it was something that I thought was quite cool and it was about 30 bucks. So you can't beat that from the local parts store uh, for something just to throw in the toolkit. Uh, the other thing is, is that you can uh, slide a breaker, like some sort of tube or something like that over this uh, ratchet. Uh, if, you, if you need to get more force, uh, you're more than likely gonna destroy the ratchet itself and some sockets but um for 30 bucks if you if you genuinely can't get a bolt undone it's probably worth a crack and um and no pun intended but it's a, a pretty good bit of gear in my mind but old cheese leaving uh, just north of surface paradise in a car that only had a clutch problem and a fuel leak before we picked it up so uh 1200 k's this should be be pretty interesting i have uh, a high degree of confidence for us making it home by the end of the day sounds good though looks good Getting many compliments. <laughs> Listen to this. So we're in Ball Ballina, quick health check. Just checking the oil, water, seeing how much fuel's leaking out of the carbs, uh, making sure that our clutch fluid isn't leaking down because we, we sought to fix that one before we left. Uh, just it just everything seems to be running along pretty well uh, happily sits along at sort of 80 mile an hour which is which is pretty ridiculous for a car that's uh, from 1965 it's doing its job exceptionally well obviously the interior this one is part of the the big thing the big selling point uh, this one's actually 
uh, been redone. So they've, they've sort of got $30,000 odd worth of receipts. Look at this horrible fucking mid 2000 CD player. That shit is coming straight out. That cannot live there. But uh, otherwise, looks pretty good. Even the, the roof lining's looking exceptionally nice. Made it to Coast Harbour. Doesn't seem to be doing anything that it shouldn't be doing. Runs a little bit warmer than what you probably consider to be normal, but look, apart from that, it's really getting along exceptionally well. It's super comfortable to drive even. So no complaints at the moment. Uh, driving, buying old classic cars that are completely unknown and driving them halfway across the country is, uh, is a good idea. So, quite clearly made it home. Really good that we made it pretty much unscathed. Uh, a couple of minor issues, but honestly nothing uh, really to speak of whatsoever. It sat happily on 80 to 90 indicated on the speedo for most of the way, uh, which is pretty amazing for a car that's from 1965. I was super surprised at the way that it would sort of just eat up miles and, and do it relatively comfortably. It's just like sitting in a big lounge chair and cruising along the highway. So that was actually a really good experience. The reason we bought this is uh, basically my old man bought an XT GT instead of a Mark II Jag with a 3.8 litre in it back in the 60s uh, so he wanted to I guess have have this experience mark two Jags even in undesirable 3.4 litre form with an auto box uh, still sitting around about the $35,000 mark uh, in Australia this was 28 and it's with the 3.8 litre with the four speed and electric overdrive it's actually really really fun to drive just to switch up and down on the overdrive on four slots so uh, look really fun uh, now I know I promised to give everyone a tour of the factory for Cobras and GT40s that I, I think are some of the best best replicas in, in the world uh, what I wasn't able to do is obviously uh, crack the camera out on short notice here we go what I wasn't able to do was crack the camera out on short notice uh, because there's lots of people obviously that are building the car of their dreams there and they may not want that stuff to be sort of widely publicized so I didn't even ask the question. What I was able to do is take a few choice photographs and just sort of explain why I think these are such great replicas. Uh, to start with they are exceptionally accurate in terms of the body style. Um, they aren't based on uh, you know an assortment of, of uh, bits from other cars, donor vehicles, which means that they've got great flexibility in able to enabling the like I guess enabling the factory to put in the latest tech into their their vehicles, so that you really do have all of the the retro feel and the analog driving experience with all the modern mod cons, such as a, a car that actually handles well and is screwed together and has appropriate cooling and can deal with modern traffic and all of these sorts of things, which is really important uh, if you want to enjoy the car as this thing from just uh, disappear up your own backside uh, working on it all the time uh, having owned and driven a few historics uh, they are really a project uh, and you can find that if you if you sort of own them it can be a bit of a ruinous experience financially and also time wise for people who just want to get out and just enjoy the vehicle so these things come with uh, full TIG welded chassis uh, you can literally pick up the chassis with two people absolutely no dramas if it's a Cobra for example um, they are built to accommodate a range of engines, everything from say 351 to 427s through to LSA uh, engines, um, anywhere from I don't care, 280 horsepower through to 1,000 plus, and people have done it. They get raced fairly regularly. Uh, pretty much if you see uh, 10 absolute pace Cobras turn up at the Cobra Nationals, the top 10 placings will be those absolute pace Cobras. That's how competitive they are and how, and how well they drive. The fact that they are a bespoke chassis uh, that's built to work for, for uh, around the body means that you don't have all of these funny things like offset pedal boxes uh, that can potentially be a bit, bit, of, bit of a pain uh, in terms of, uh, I guess, having decent ergonomics to, to drive them a long way. Um, there's a whole heap of other things such as, you know, they have modern uh, Tremec TR6060 boxes, uh, decent LSDs, they have inboard mounted shocks with uh, CNC machined uh, suspension componentry, as you can see, uh, bugger all unsprung weight, and, and they've been, uh, I guess, tried and tested and developed over a number of years now that they, they've gotten up to a stage where they, they really are quite quite a good thing and, and they've ironed out a lot of the issues. So, look, you can make your own judgments. I do recommend that you look up Absolute Pace if you are interested in doing a replica. I believe that they are looking at doing left-hand drive versions, which obviously would suit someone internationally, and they are looking at doing an electric GT40 for all the shandy drinkers out there. So, look, certainly have a look at it. Um, I think these kits are absolutely amazing. I will get up there at some stage and do a proper video and a proper tour uh, of, of their facility. I'm sure Craig, who owns the place, would be more than welcoming uh, for me to do that. Uh, he, he accommodated us uh, very well in the end because we turned up late after picking up the Jag and having to iron, iron out a few things. Uh, so I do certainly appreciate that from him. Uh, otherwise, is I'm going to give it to uh, 
Matthias, who runs a, an Opal with a transaxle and a V6 that he's actually fitted to it. The car is absolutely wicked. Um, I, I can't sort of say that I'm, I'm very uh, admiring of the fact that that guy's uh, spent a lot of time developing his car into something that's very, very quick. And if you have a look on his uh, Instagram, which I think is speeds to V6, uh, I'm sure he'll comment down the bottom to, to claim his Raptor controller. Uh, very worthwhile having a look. He has stuff like he's built himself a, a homemade CNC machine and a few different bits and pieces, which is really good. Uh, special mention to people like Joel K, who has a, uh, an, a a YouTube channel. Uh, he's building an SLC. Uh, I couldn't give it away to uh, one of the guys who who uh, did have an MX5 because I thought that might be a bit of a uh, what do you say conflict of interest. Um, and there was also a special mention to to one of the guys, uh, jo who was uh, building a um, a Celica with an M3 DCT box running an Mtron. Really really cool stuff. So look, it was a hard choice, but uh, Matthias definitely has a, a pretty amazing bit of gear that he's he's building at home. So uh, I'll put up a picture of that here. Uh, and of course have a bit of a look at his Instagram or YouTube or whatever it is that he runs uh, if, if you're interested anyhow thanks very much and look I can't I can't say uh, thank you enough to Lee for for giving uh, the Raptor controller to us to to be able to give away that's that's very very generous of him he's a proper car bloke and if you are interested in one of these uh, just hit up Summit Technology sending an, send him an email and tell him what you want to do they do offer a couple of other project products as well like a, uh, a switch panel that works very well and will work with your race gloves on uh, dexterity being very important in that regard and it's a solid state switching setup and he also uh, offers a few other products so check out Summit Technologies if you have a, a race car or, or a trick road car anyhow look thanks very much watching uh until next week uh in which time i've got a new fire system that arrived today uh from motorsport race gear in in sydney very helpful guys there which means that i have to explain why i blew my cash on my original fire system which isn't going to fit the bill and um we might get to dressing this motor so that i can get it fitted up here and finish building my wiring loom which would be pretty fun so anyhow thanks very much uh catch you soon